All right, thanks, Jim. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for attending the webinar. This is the same webinar we gave yesterday, and both are recorded, and they're going to be posted in the CR DOS toolbox, and I'll show you where that is on a Google Drive later. All right, so I'm the Aviation Program Leader here at Weather Service Milwaukee Sullivan, and Jerry Wiedenfeld is sitting here with me, too. He's the ITO, and he'll be here for technical questions. He can answer them for you at the end of the talk. I'm going to try to be brief, and then we'll have lots of time for questions and comments at the end. Brian Hirsch, he's the Central Region Aviation Program Leader. He's heading this up on the regional level. Uh, Jeff Craven is involved with this as well uh, at the regional level. And then Tammy Sims is the Digital Aviation Program Services Lead from NWS headquarters in DC. So a big project, big group involved. And I just want to give you an update on what Central Region is doing for the Digital Aviation Services Program. Two days ago, there was a tech note in, um, released for all of Central Region. And the tech note goes to the ITOs. And that requires each office to install a certain program. So uh, Jerry designed the tech note. And what he did was he put in the new, the, the new TAF formatter. And this is, this is a much better formatter, I think. It's new and improved. And this is the one that GSD, Global Services Division out of Boulder, made. Um, now, they've made, they made the last one, too. But there's been a lot of improvements, a lot of changes made. So now you're using a new and, into, new and improved TAF formatter. Uh, this tech note is due to be installed by June 26th. But uh, you know, just talk to your ITO, see when they can get to it. It's not a, not a really big, long install. So it should be pretty quick and straightforward. The TAF formatter comes with new features. We're going to use a little different standardized sky cover thresholds and some new weather thresholds. Um, we made some minor updates to Aviation Finalized. Denny Van Cleave here at our office worked with doing the, the tools and procedures. Um, and then Jerry also passed around to everyone with this tech note that you're going to get a 12-panel D2D procedure that contains a lot of the GFE elements. And I'll explain that and show you an example later. So everyone will have that. Um, with the new task formatter, there's just a slightly different GUI. And it's showing up here on the screen. What I want to point out to you is that there, the middle section with the radio button kind of over to the right, allow multi-hour tempo and prob groups. We have this defaulted to select yes. Um, if you only want one hour tempo or prob groups, then it would be selected to no. But we figured, why not? Um, so talking about the new thresholds, sky cover, we changed the percentages just a little bit. And this was agreed upon nationally. So now everyone will be on the same page as everyone in the country gets spun up with digital aviation services. Whether they do digital aviation services the way Central Region does or maybe a little different way, we still have the same formatter and we still have the same um, sky threshold. Okay, now this is where we can, we can customize by each office the weather rule. What I have laid out here in the table for you is um, two different tables, one for thunderstorms in particular. How does the formatter handle thunderstorms in the TAF? And then the blue graph is how, to hand, how does the formatter handle rain, snow, or other precipitation in the TAF? Um, so the way it's set up and the way it's defaulted for all of Central Region is that um, in the first couple of hours, let's say you have likely or categorical wording in your weather. Um, now, it doesn't, go, it doesn't read the pop grid. The TAF formatter reads what is in your weather grid. So likely or some sort of categorical um, wording in the first couple hours of your TAF will give you prevailing thunder in your TAF. Later out in the period, it'll only say VCTS or 
um, some combination. It works similarly but a little different with your other types of precipitation. Well, the thing that is nice now is that we included instructions for modifying your weather rules per office. So that way, just one, one thing you're going to notice is that it might give you a lot of now, some offices don't use Prop 30. They have kind of a local policy that says, we will not put Prop 30s in our tasks. If that's the case, that's fine, but you're going to have to modify your weather rules portion, and your AWIPS focal point or ITO will be able to do this, and you do this in your task underscore site name underscore definition file. Um, so that's I have instructions in the document in the CR DOS toolbox and also linked with the tech note. Um, we limited Prob 30 groups to only show up between 9 and 18 hours of the task period, so they're not allowed in the outer periods. Um, but that's just if it's seeing a wording of scattered or chance in the weather grids that it would include a Prob 30. Um, you have the ability to put your your CAC rules in this file as well, and we encourage this. It's going to come with customization abilities, and that's a good thing. Uh, Denny made a couple updates to the aviation finalized procedure. He added some new time range options. So this way, if you're going to be making amendments by through your grids with your task formatter, you can do that easily. What happened was earlier, uh, some of the finalized didn't capture the whole time period that you were editing. So this one just fixed some bugs and added some extra time periods. Now here is a snapshot of the 12 panel procedure that everyone gets. Notice there are um, there's a model that shows up in every one of these screens. Um, what it says in your tech note is if you get this, and you don't see all of the models, then you need to talk to Jerry or the gridded methodology team, and they can help you through making sure that you have all of the models that are available to every, that should be available to every office and that are all contained in ConShort. This is a good check to make sure every office has all the elements in ConShort. This is the example for visibility, and now I'm going to show you the example for cloud-based primary. Um, what an advantage of having a 12-panel D2D procedure is, is this. When you're looking through GFE, you'd have to step through every model for a certain time period in order to compare the differences. What this D2D 12-panel procedure does is it shows exactly the gridded model data, what would show up in your GFE, but it shows it in a different format. So it's kind of a, a better snapshot of all at the same time you can see a 12 panel. And uh, Jerry just reminded me to let you know something about this 12 panel procedure. At this time, there is a known bug. There is a trouble ticket open through NCS, but the models will not automatically update with this procedure at this time. So in order to get the models to update, like say you want to look at the latest RAP or HER model, you're going to have to reopen that procedure periodically. So just to know how to do that. Also, in this document, this install document that is connected with your tech note, it'll tell how it'll remind you how to navigate through the D2D12 panel. There are ways to view one panel at a time then return to the 12 panels. Um, all that's laid out in this document with the tech note. Okay, Brian Hirsch a while back, he made up a CR DOS status spreadsheet. This is a Google spreadsheet, so it, you know, it's always being updated by anybody. And what we encourage you to do at your office is make sure that your, your, this list is up to date. And it lets Brian know from a regional level, who is uh, getting, who's making their tasks from their grid? 
um, and who is um, sending the grids to NDSD and point and click. So it, they want to, he wants to get a gauge of what kind of activity each office is having. A little bit more on this toward the end of the presentation. Now remember, when we did a webinar back in January, I talked about kind of process toward transitioning to digital aviation services. Everyone has undergone step one, where everyone has all of the mo has con shorts and all the aviation models installed in your offices. Hopefully, you're looking through the model data and kind of using it. Um, your half formatter is populated in the background, but you may or may not be looking at that. So what I encourage you, if you are just at that step one, have you and your forecasters move on to step two, use your TAF formatter as a starting point when you're making your TAF. Uh, this is a good way to uh, utilize the TAF formatter and make our grids consistent with what um, our grids are saying. Make our tasks consistent with what the grids are saying. You'll notice that your winds are consistent with your grids. And also, your from groups are going to be kind of mapped out for you. You might have to delete lines, but it's always easier to delete lines than add them. Uh, this makes the task writing process easier, I think, and, and possibly quicker. And just so you know, we are able to see NDFD graphics internally, how our neighbors are doing aviation grids. Um, notice there are some people out on the East Coast that have aviation grids as well. Um, but mo mainly it's central region, and that's because of the tech note in January that installed all of the aviation grids across central region. You can see these yourselves in the AWIPS Firefox web browser, and I included the URL in this presentation. All right, so now let's say your office has been looking at the models that go into aviation grids and that they've been starting with the TAF formatter and they, they might even be experimenting with changing some grids to make the formatter work better, make, make it look better with how they would want the task to look. Okay, so this means that your forecasters might be getting frustrated because there's a script that runs every six hours and wipes out any changes they made in the grids because it populates con short automatically. If your forecasters are getting frustrated with this, that means your office should be ready to move on to the experimental phase. Um, there is one thing that needs to be done. Your ITO needs to rerun a script in order to take out that automatic population. Now, a banner will pop up every five and a half hours, and that will make it be so everybody's reminded to keep the grids updated. If no one updates it, it will update automatically, but at least it's a warning. Um, your local office team needs to have approval to move on to the step. And your forecasters are going to have this natural progression to want to make changes to the grids. When you're doing this, remember that you should forecast flight categories, not necessarily the specific ceiling or visibility values that you're expecting to see in the observation, because there is some rounding involved. So step three, graphically, you can see that the aviation populate procedure, you, you run it or it could run automatically if you allow it to. Um, you can you evaluate, you make edits to the con short. I'm going to get into a little bit of that later. And this is make edits only where you feel like there's a time period that it needs help. Um, then you run aviation finalize, and incorporated into that are the aviation QC tools and it can publish the grids, then you can run the task formatter. Uh, you go into AVN FPS, you pull up what this formatter gave you, and then you make some edits. You probably will have to make a few edits, um, and then you send them like you normally would. And this is for the routine task. You have 
options to make it to do this process for amended tasks as well. Eventually, um, we are going to be routinely editing, collaborating, saving, publishing aviation grids, probably on a routine task basis. We're going to be sending the ceiling and visibility grids to NDFD and point and click, and we're going to be running our task formatter and making our tasks from that starting point before sending. This is when your office is considered operational. There is going to be a central region test bed for the digital aviation services. Right now there's a proposal made by the grid methodology team that will be negotiated through the Regional Labor Council. The test bed is proposed to run August to November of this year. And what it's going to do is explore some collaboration methods and find some best practices for grid population. It's also going to work with some experimental gridded guidance from the Aviation Weather Center. So the goal of that's proposed right now, it's not final, is that CRDOS would become operational in the spring of 2017. So where is a good place to find all the information and give us feedback, give the, the CRDOS team some feedback, ask questions? Well, there is the centralized location of VLAB. Now, some of you perhaps are signed up to the CRSU account in VLAB, and we are asking that you sign up for the CRDOS VLAB account. Now, with VLAB, you have to go into the main VLAB website first. Then you have to find the available community called CRDOS in the far right column, and you select Join. Then you can go directly to the CRDOS VLAB account after you're a member. So this outlines the sign-up procedure. But after that, you can find forums, and that's where you ask questions and give comments. All right, a little bit on Consort. We are getting out of the winter season. We're getting into the summer season. And I just want to say Consort is really good with IFR situations. Verifies well, gives you a great starting point for forecasting. Now, Consort does struggle with diurnal cumulus, especially, and then convective situations, which move, you know, works with the diurnal cumulus. Um, so I just want to remind everybody that there is a tool available to help us in those situations. It's called Cloud-Based Primary from RH. Everyone has it installed in their uh, populate menu of GSE. And this is a great tool to use for diurnal cumulus. What you would do is run it for only the time period that you're expecting diurnal cumulus. So I don't, for example, 15Z to 0Z or 1Z, something like that. Um, what it does is, like, imagine what you're looking at in buff kit. You're, for the ceiling height or the base, cloud base, you would or this tool will pick up on the RH. And it, you can alter the sensitivity of it by the RH threshold um, slider bar at the bottom of the GUI. But anyway, it's going to give you a, a better first guess for your cloud base. And remember, this is just define, you're defining your cloud base height. This has nothing to do with your coverage. Remember that your sky grid determines your coverage, if it's going to be broken or if it's going to be scattered. Now, the only two tools that are the only two grids you're going to be editing are visibility and cloud-based primary. And these are automatically populated with the con short or blend of models of your choice. This is Those are the two that you edit. Now, there are three other weather element group or weather elements that are in there that are um, that are always blank because they're not populated by a model. The thing is you can you can add values to these grids if you want for whatever time period you think they're going to need it. And so I'm just going to give you a little extra help about help with this because they're just optional. Um, the cloud-based secondary 
is something you can do to add a lower cloud-based group. Now, let me just give you an example. A couple weeks ago, I was on the aviation desk, and we had um, broken or overcast 25,000 foot Cirrus. Okay, um, and but we were it was thin enough that diurnal Q were developing, and those bases were about 5,000 feet. So what I did was I populated for just the afternoon hours in cloud-based secondary a 5,000 foot cloud-based secondary height. And so what it did in the TAF is it gave me scattered 050, broken 250. And that's exactly what I needed for those afternoon hours. So these grids are just there to help you um, when you need them. Now there's cloud-based conditional and visibility conditional. These grids can be populated for just a certain time period where you would like to add a tempo group. Now, by, by the directive, tempos can only be in the first nine hours of the task, so this is the only time your formatter would pick up on that. I think in the future, it'll add a Prop 30 group if you wanted, if it was outside of that nine hours. Um, but anyway, this is a way of manually putting in a tempo group. This is an alternate way of doing it. This would be manual versus what the formatter will give you based on those weather rules that you can define. Also, I'd like to advertise something that's coming soon, we'll say. Uh, Jerry's going to release this in a future tech note, but he's working on making a GFE forecast monitor that contains, um, contains the aviation weather elements. Now, I'm waiting for the screen to update. Here it is. Now you should be able to see it. So what he added was ceiling of visibility for all of your, your METAR sites. Now, I don't know if every office has a GFE forecast monitor at this time, but if you don't, you can look for that soon. This is a situational awareness tool. Already, we, we monitor our TAF constantly with the AVN FPS. But how are we going to how are we going to monitor how our grids are doing at the other ASOS and AWAS sites? Well, this is a way of just being able to visually see if we're on track, if the observations are on track with our grid. So look for this in, in the coming months. So moving on, um, in our, our, our last webinar in January, I introduced the CR Dots toolbox. It's a Google Drive. And so all of the presentations I gave in January are in this toolbox. What I'm going to be doing is updating the presentations and making sure that I've got the latest screen captures in there and the latest methodology in there. And I will put the old presentations in a, a subfolder. Now, for this update, this May May June 2016 update with its new TAF formatter. I'm putting everything in a CR DOS toolbox May 2016 subfolder. So as long as you have access to the CR DOS toolbox, you're going to have access to everything in the subfolder. The recordings are also available here. Um, and what that document that is attached to the tech note is also in this folder. It's called CR DOS new formatter. Um, update install procedure. Notice also that there's this DIS guide underscore AYD. Patrick Eide from Bismarck office, he made a two-page DOS guide um, and he made one for the last version but what he did was he updated it to have the latest sky threshold and weather thresholds but he also made the publisher file available in case your office chooses to modify the weather rules. Then you'd be able to modify this two-page document and put it in your operations area as kind of a cheat sheet for your forecasters. So look for that. It's a nice guide. Also available in the toolbox is that CRDOS status spreadsheet. And it 
that's what Brian Hirsch made, and he, he wants everyone to see where you're at. So there's a pull-down menu in each grid box, and a, he wants to gauge, are you interested, trying, testing, or doing? Um, what's your point of contact for your office? And so what I'd like to do now, I'm, I'm done, done with my main part of my talk, is I'd like people to speak up. Um, if you could chat or raise your hand in, in the GoToWebinar GUI, then uh, Jim can unmute your line, and you can let, let the group know how you're doing. What I would like to know is, okay, if your office is spun up with DOS, do you love it? Do you like it? What are some things that could be better? Do you have any questions? Or if your office is just starting to spin up, you know, what, what are you finding? Or if your office is hesitant to move forward with DOS, what is holding you back? And uh, we, can, we can talk about it. So I'm opening it up to people for questions. Jim, have there been any questions so far? No, it's, it's been quiet. No hands up or no questions typed into uh, the question box as of yet. Again, if you do want to uh, comment or talk about what your office has done and you don't have a microphone, just go ahead and type in the comments. I can read it or same thing for questions. Um, Raise your hand or go ahead and type your question in there. I think we got all the questions yesterday, Marcia. I think we did. Um, Jerry, did you want to add anything like things we covered yesterday from the questions? All right, can we have one office that's out there? Can, can someone just raise their hand and get unmuted? Okay, I do have one here from uh, Dave Blanchard. Dave, I've unmuted you. You want to go ahead and ask your question? Yeah, I, uh, I wrote it in text also, but um, we, uh, I don't think we're receiving the NARRE TL uh, data in GFE. Is there, is that some kind of local problem we're having. Is everybody supposed to be receiving that uh, model data? Yeah, I've been, this is Jerry, I've been working with a number of sites. A lot of sites have actually been missing that particular model. Um, in most cases, it tends to be um, a, a problem on the LDAD side where it's actually fetching the model data. Um, it, this model is a model that is fetched by Central Region Headquarters and then they host the data on LDM. Um, so if, if your office is having problems getting it, you know, just um, have your AWIF focal or ITO contact me and um, I can work with that office and make sure you're, you get it. Um, I mean, that, that actually does bring up a good point. And Marsha sort of touched on this. The, the real big reason why we wanted people to all look at that D2D procedure um, that shows GFE data is to really you know, get get a feeling for what models your office has or is missing. Um, you know, there's been lots of updates to ALIPS over the past you know, year or so, and some of these updates have caused random little problems in codes. I dealt with one office that, you know, was getting the HRR data but was missing uh, cloud-based primary, and it was due to a GRIB2 table issue. Um, so, you know, there's lots of little problems that can happen, and, you know, it's uh, to nobody's fault, it just happens. So uh, this is a good chance for offices to take a look at the data, make sure they're getting all the model ingest. ConShort is extremely dependent upon the models that um, it's using. So if it's missing models, that, those models I have in there for a very specific reason, um, and it's either to cover you know, a, a period that doesn't exist it, or because the model performs very well, uh, so if you're missing a model, it does. It is a big detriment to con short. Great. I'll uh, I'll look at the um, the D two D twelve panel and, and see what we have uh, in addition. Uh, thank you. 
Yeah, thank you. And like I said, feel free to put somebody in contact with me. I'm happy to work with people. And I guess, you know, Marsha asked me while I'm talking if I had something to say. I want this to be an open floor. I want people to really provide feedback to us. Um, you know, Con Short, it has its problems. She mentioned the, the diurnal problem uh, with the cumulus, and, and that's a problem. And I, I believe it's related be, to all of the models that it's ingesting. And, you know, it's sort of a fine scale feature. So maybe the models are popping Q in one place but not another, and then you throw all of them together. It could cause, you know, Con Short to not really recognize where the lower, um, you know, ceilings or cloud-based heights are. So it, that's something I want to work on. And in yesterday's call, um, Steve Fliegel, the new Sioux over in Aberdeen, he, he came up with an idea that I'm going to try to work on. So if you have ideas to improve the process, I, I want to hear them. Um, I want this to be a, a regional process of how we can improve the whole thing, and that will help the national goal of improving the aviation um, process. And uh, another thing that I think we talked about yesterday was uh, there's going to be um, an operational proving ground um, held this year or this this summer um, with AV DAS, um, and it's going to take a good hard look at the models. And they're going to be populating with some of the Aviation Weather Center grids, as well as what's called the GLAMP MELD. Um, that's a, it's an, a new update to the ceiling and viz grids from GLAMP. Um, it uses a, a blending of GLAMP as well as the HRR. And it's been verifying very well here, as well as Bismarck. Bismarck has it, I believe. Um, so it, it's one of our highest model, verifying models right now. It's not currently in kind of short since it's experimental. Um, and it does, you know, come and go at, from time to time. Um, and then they're going to also look at an, another new model, hopefully from GSD, called Point Blend, which is similar to kind of short, but it actually weights models based on the specific point. It's sort of, um, it's much closer to how the national blend is uh, created. So this um, that's an exciting thing. We're hoping GSD can get that up and running because um, that might be a very good solution to some of these um, really local level problems. So we're excited for that, that uh, proving ground to take a look at this DAS stuff. I think that lots of good information will come from there. Okay, we uh, got a little more activity now. Um, Jeff Craven here at Central Region is asking, um, are we working on a standard for the 7 versus 10 mile visibility? He says it's, uh, it seems like we could standardize that for the sake of the graphics. Yeah, I agree. That should be standardized. <laughs> um, I, you know, I think that's something we need to bring up on the national level because um, it is you know, even I myself, when I was creating the the new stuff for the forecast monitor, um, you know, the METARs come out with 10 mile, um, 10 mile viz, and we only would cap it at seven. So I think that is something that needs to be looked at, and um, we'll bring it up on the national level. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. All right, a um, couple hand. Well, let me read the questions, and I'll get to the folks that have their hands up. Um, another question uh, from Andy in Wichita uh, says here, why does Visby's default to 7 versus 10 statute miles? Looking at the NDFD display, it's analogous to the 14 silent pop. It looks like a patchwork quilt. <laughs> Andy, I agree with you. Okay, right now, there's the aviation finalized does something to the visibility. If your visibility is, I mean, just think which way it goes. Could go several ways. So I'll give you one example. If your visibility from consort is low and say five miles or three miles and you decide as a forecaster you're not going to match that with the fog, so you're going to choose not to have fog, what the aviation finalized will do when it's QC process will change any of those lower visibilities to 7 SM. It doesn't change it to 10. And that's why you see the differences between 7 and 10. 
Does that answer your question, Andy? I'll, uh, yeah, you said it does, yes. All right, thanks. Okay, Ed Ray has a question here. Um, he says, is there another option in the new formatter to only allow tempos and not PROB 30? We have never had success here at Jackson with PROB 30s. All right, Ed, I will answer that question for you. This, will get that, this gets back into the weather rules part of your, your task. Um, configuration file. It's in your TAP definition file. Um, this is editable by your AWEB's a focal point or your ITO. And Jerry, it, Jerry will have help for you if you need help editing this weather rules part of the file. What you'll have to do is uncomment some lines and then change some of the code. This will override what was sent out to all of Central Region. Um, that is a way you can get rid of your Prop 30s in the TAF formatter. So yes, your office can do that. We can be providing guidance. I'm going to get that out to everyone next week. How about that? You're not the first person to ask that. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I was a little late getting into this conference because I was actually working with another site on that very specific question too. So you know, the more questions I get, obviously, the better I'll be able to answer them. Um, but yeah, that's definitely an editable feature. All right. He says, thanks for the information. Uh, let's go to um, one of the questions on the phone. Uh, Katie Branham, I've unmuted you. You want to ask your question? Katie, you're open. Yeah, uh, it, it's going along the same, same things as those weather rules and the definitions file. Uh, are we able to lower the threshold for which vicinity thunder will be mentioned? Katie, er, yes, yes, you will. Um, let me get to the weather rules ta er, table here. All of these rules from this table are editable in your TAF definition file. Now, there are instructions located. Er, there's instructions are written by DSD developer, and all of that is linked in the install document that was included with the tech note. So you do have all of this information on how to change it. And if you need any help at all, um, email Jerry. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. Yep, you're welcome. OK. Um, Gerald, uh, I've unmuted you. You want to go ahead and ask your, your question? Gerald Claycomb. Uh, yeah, this is uh, Zach from Cheyenne. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Zach. OK. Um, yeah, I've looked at some of the verification stuff for our uh, TAF sites, and it seems like um, uh, Consort is, is pretty much the top performing model when uh, you look at the high key and the ETS. Um, my main question is, uh, is there going to be any work done maybe to um, you know look at the percentages in more detail? Because uh, uh, I noticed, like, for cloud-based primary, the uh, GFS lamp, um, you know, is the second best behind Consort. But when you look at visibility, it, it tends to fall off a little bit. So I don't know. Is there going to be any more work at, you know, maybe a region-wide thing to see which, which kind of just look at the percentages in more detail? Zach, when you're saying percentages, are you talking about the verification percentages? No. Or oh, the weight, the weight that goes weight, into yeah, that go into consort. Got it. Yeah, um, that is, it's sort of a, a a tricky deal when you're dealing with the weights. Um, I've, and you're right. Um, visibility, especially in the mountainous area for for G lamp, um, it do, it it doesn't do quite as well. Developers, when they're working with the MELD, they've been working really hard with the Montana sites um, to try to improve GLAMP MELD for visibility. Um, so as far as the weight that goes in the con short, I'm always sort of looking at that. Um, it's tough because, you know, once you set it, it it's set. 
Um, that, that's one of the negative things with ConShort is that it's not a dynamic um, blend. Point blend, however, which is why I was sort of excited about that, will be a dynamic blend where the weights will actually change per model per point. Um, and by point, I mean actually like two and a half kilometer grid. So, you know, we're somewhat excited about it. I know with ceiling and viz, it gets, it gets a little tricky to try to determine those weights. Um, so, yeah, I, I know it, I'm going to probably take a harder look once, now that we have more of a national scale um, verification going on. Uh, we're hoping that eventually we can get sort of the similar extended verification that we have with the XML database so that we can start doing some, um, nat or some regional level stats on the aviation um, verification. And that may help us a little bit better with the, the blends, the, the more static blends. So um, I know that's sort of getting around the question, but it, it, it is on, always on my mind, and I'm sure it's on a lot of people's mind. So yes. Yeah, and I can go ahead and uh, post the, the stats from uh, CYS here, maybe to the VLAB. That would be page. great. I, yeah, I love seeing stats. So. I know I'm one of those weirdos that love stats, but, um, you know, yeah, post, post away. I like to see that stuff. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's all I got from Cheyenne. All right. Thanks, thanks Zach. Um, I do have a question here from Jonathan Carney. Will we be able to enter runway configurations into the TAF monitor so the formatter can, quote, unquote, ignore insignificant wind shifts? Okay. Well, that's a great idea. <laughs> and we can uh, we can look into something like that. But no, that wasn't in our thought process yet. So thanks for the idea, John. And that by the TAF monitor, can can you tell us what you mean by exactly TAF monitor? Which one? Like AVN FPS, or are you thinking the the GF? Uh, graded forecast monitor that Jerry is going to be sending out eventually. And Jonathan, I unmuted you. If you can go ahead and speak, if you're able to do that. Can you hear me now? Yeah, go ahead, yeah. Jonathan. Okay. Uh, no, it's actually the TAF formatter, uh, the actual um, uh, the the formatter that takes our grids and and translates them into TAFs. Because I mean, you know, for our I'll just use Lambert Field in St. Louis as an example. Um, you know, if they're landing planes on runway 30, then you know they they don't really care whether the wind is 180 or 160 or 150 or you know any of those in between. Um, you know, just and, and a lot of times we'll get 13, 14 line tafts for really insignificant wind shifts. I mean, the the the, the by Directive, yeah, you have to amend every time there's a 30 degree wind shift, but you know, I think, you know, pretty much out beyond about three or five hours, nobody cares because everybody's landing to the to the northwest anyway. So we'll have these really huge long tafts for wind shifts that are really don't make any difference to anybody. Okay, so John, um, there are a couple things that you can do. First. First off, I, I can bring up to GSD that there is a request for putting in a runway configuration into the TAF formatter code. Now that's something GSD would have to do, and it would maybe go into the CAC rule. Okay, so when I say CAC, you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so right now the TAF formatter can handle CAC rules. You have to put them in in the weather rules part of it and there are instructions from GSD on how to do that. Um, but I think that only handles the ceiling of visibility thresholds. I don't think it, it handles wind. What is another option that you can do in your weather rules part of the TAF formatter is edit your wind change direction threshold. Right now it is set at 30, like you said, but you could make that 40 for the TAF so it's less sensitive. Okay. Um, I can't make it by runway. 
the yeah. way it's set up right now. I, I we cannot do that. But okay. I can put that in our wish list from GSD. That would be a great wish list a thing for the wish list. I mean, because you know, uh, crossing you know the, those those runway thresholds is a big deal for. Um, you know, for the FAA, uh, you know, when they want to, you know, if they have to turn an airport around, it takes a little bit of time. Yeah, well, I know that would be handy for Milwaukee Taft and also Chicago. So, um, oh, yeah. you're not the only person. So, I'll put that on the wish list, and we can just kind of put that. Hopefully, they can work that in down the line. Thanks cool. For the thank you. John. Mm -hmm. Thanks. All right. Thanks, John. I've um, got another question um, here from Andy in Wichita. It says, when are collaboration standards going to be addressed? As we move to a fully integrated field structure, it's not just about the local WFO forecast, but how the forecast syncs with CWSU and AWC forecasts. This is part of the, the what we're hoping to get accomplished with the test beds. Um, yeah, I mean, this, this is a very high level, um, you know, question. I, and then something that we certainly want to make sure is addressed. Uh, and that's part of the reason why we're coming up with a standard starting point, so that at least we have the same starting point across the region. Um, that starting point doesn't have to be kind of short. We're starting with Conshore right now since that's what seems to be verifying the best at most sites. But, you know, through the test bed process and as well as, you know, the OPG, we may come up with a different, um, a, a different first guess. And, you know, once the whole nation gets on board, that first guess could be the Aviation Weather Center grids. Um, so, you know, that's one way to try to mitigate um, seams. But, there obviously has to be some kind of threshold that we're going to set in how we do this collaboration. Um, perfect would be nice, but that may cause a lot of work. So we're hoping that by getting, you know, these couple test beds set up, both like four to five sites, that they'll be they'll help us with best practices and how to how to get that set up. And um, I'll read a comment here from Jeff Craven, and I'm assuming Jeff, you can't um, talk since we're in separate rooms uh, with your computer. But he says here um, that the OPG AWC CR test bed is June and August. Says uh, they're working on it, and AWC will be the leader going forward on the first guest ceiling and visibilities and the development of these national blend of model inputs. Thanks for adding that, Jeff. All righty. I do not have anything else at the current time, Marsha or Jerry. All right. Well, I want to thank everyone for attending today. Um, at your earliest convenience, make sure you get signed up in VLAB and feel free to add comments to the forum if you want. Also, please keep your input, uh, keep your update, ah, can't talk, keep your status at this uh, DAS status spreadsheet up to date for your office. That way uh, Brian can have a regional view of how you're doing and everyone else can see where the offices, where their neighboring offices are in the process of, of digital aviation services. So thanks a lot for your time today, everyone. Okay, one, one more thing. Um, let me just double check to make sure I'm seeing if I'm staying up here. Jonathan Carney in St. Louis, do you have another question or did I just not? close you out. Uh, no, I, I had an, another question. Okay, go ahead. Um, and this is kind of sort of an open question for, for anybody. Um, so we have about five people, I think, you know, just playing with the grids and we're, we're publishing them and, and we're um, generating TAFs and going with those TAFs. Um, the thing that we have found uh, to be a, a, a real source of frustration for us is uh, forecasting convection and and making that good in our TAFs, and we've been you know working real hard to try to put some you know hourly uh, pops in you know try to be real granular with these with our with our weather and our and our pops you know out through 24 and you know, Lambert's a 30 hour TAF and we're we're really trying hard to do this and we really haven't found a good strategy for it. Um, 
you know, we we were kind of surprised at how easy we thought we felt it was with winter weather and you know IFR, and it's like, oh, this is not so bad. And then we started to get into convection, and we're just we're just you know grinding our teeth. And I was wondering, does anybody have a good strategy that they've found uh, to to help us with convection? And we you know, like I said, this is sort of an open question to anybody. Okay, well, I'll start answering, and if anybody else wants to chime in, please raise your hand, and Jim will unmute your line. John, to my knowledge, I don't know if anyone has a great solution. I can <laughs> reach out to some of the other offices that are, are doing DAS actively right now and see if, like, I know Bismarck works a lot with it, and they might have something that works. What I found is our new TAP formatter is really nice for handling convection. Uh, whatever the default you get. I mean, many forecasters here don't use Prop 30, so we just delete them from the line, yeah. and, and that's totally fine. A few of them actually like Prop 30, so I haven't, we don't have a policy against it. But anyway, I like where it puts the VCTS. I like where it will say prevailing showers tempo TS. Um, and uh, the TAP is a planning tool and I think digital aviation has to be a planning tool. Um, and then, yeah, we need to pinpoint where convection would be in the first two hours. That's very it's difficult to do graphically. If you can, that's wonderful. If you can't, you know, don't beat yourself up and make sure you get the amendments out in a timely fashion like you always do through AV and FPS. Right. Um, so I would just say do your best and let me know if you find anything. But I know con short isn't going to help you with the ceilings very much, but that's where that RH from uh, model thing comes in handy. So Yeah, we love that tool here. We, we use it extensively. Good. As far, as far as pops, and I, I know that's not necessarily 100% related, but I've been working hard to try to improve the con short pops. Um, one thing that I've recently done is I've smart edited the MRMS data, um, which in good radar coverage has dramatically improved our POPs um, in the short term. So, you know, whereas before I was using, um, you know, an observational grid that was about an, an hour to two hours old um, and trying to blend that and move it around, um, now I'm using one that's five minutes old. Um, when it gets in the con short, so that that's a, a huge improvement to the pops. Um, now it's still dependent upon because I'm affecting, you know, that that precip that the MRMRS data has um, it says is out there, and so it's still going to be dependent upon, you know, how that movement is concerned. But what I've noticed is that our pop verification has improved pretty dramatically for con short since I started that. Yeah. Now. While that, I'm saying that, it's going to be a while before I can get that all out to you guys. Um, the reason being is the MRMS folks or whoever did the programming messed up when they grip to encoded the MRMS data. And so it doesn't quite decode correctly. And it, I have to do some magic to get it into GFE. So we have a... a um, have a DR out there to hopefully get that fixed, and once that's fixed, you guys will get it into GFE, and that will include radar data as well. Hey, we really appreciate your efforts. Thank you. Yeah. Um, sorry. Is there a good uh, would the VLab uh, site be a good place for idea sharing, or is there someplace else that? Yeah, you know that we can go. Okay, VLab. Okay. Yeah, that the whole purpose behind the VLab site is exactly that: idea sharing, problem, you know, putting out problems. Like um, I know at Pueblo, and I mentioned this on the call yesterday. Right away, as soon as we did our first call, they were saying that they were noticing some problems with the ops grid for the cloud-based primary and um, visibility grids. And so I, I started looking into it. They put it on VLab. They showed me the images, and it, it was a problem. So I, I looked into it, and we figured out what was wrong, and we've corrected that. Um, it's still not going to be 100% perfect, but it's a whole heck of a lot better than a, what it was. And where this was a problem was in very data-sparse areas, and, um, and the way I was 
the way that the um, clear skies were being decoded. So, um, you know, that, that's just one example of how we can use the VLAB. It'd be great if we can, you know, the more feedback we get on that and the VLAB, it, the better. And Marsh is bringing it up right now. Great. Thank you so much. All right. And then Jeff Craven, um, I opened his line. He does have another comment here. Go ahead, Jeff. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay, great. Yeah, I, addressing our, our, is it John from from St. Charles? Uh, yeah, we, you know, convection's probably the hardest thing we can deal with, but it's very clear to me that we need a high resolution convective allowing ensemble. To me, this is the number one priority going forward in our in our national weather prediction suite, our numerical weather prediction suite. It, I don't I can't see of anything that's more important than that. Again, the, the de deterministic HER is great, but we've got to have some kind of HER like ensemble that that the uh, can also harness not only an ensemble for each run, but also harnessing the power of time-lagged ensembles to create calibrated ensemble probabilities. I don't, you know, we're not going to find a model that accurately predicts a deterministic convective process, but at least through probabilities. And I think, I think the FAA is sophisticated enough that if we lead them into using probabilities to help with timing and location of convection, that's certainly a better option than the headless chicken dance that we perform to try to chase particularly weakly, loosely organized convection. Yeah, I mean, you're chasing your tail. I do think there's ways to, to bring out some useful information, but it, it's got to be in a probabilistic sense. So. I, I agree that if you're going to use deterministic models to try to do this, it's going to be very difficult during convective season. Uh, this is recognized and is a, it's a big deal. I, I keep, I'm sure they're tired of hearing at NSEP and EMC me calling for a convective allowing ensemble. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Um, Marsha, I don't have anything else, so I think we're probably good for this session. All right. Sounds good, and we're at one hour. So thanks a lot for everything, Tim, and everybody else for attending. All right. Thanks, everybody, and have a good weekend. Marsha. Yes? Great job, Jerry. Great job. I really appreciate all the work you've done. Uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff.